in Virginia Beach City Public Schools. So if they want to get on board, then I am going to have to think about how to really increase our numbers. Um, at this point, I've, I've trained more than about 60 teachers. We have about 40 active worlds in, in the space. And as I mentioned, um, predominantly grades 6 through 12, cross-curricular. Um, the largest percentage are probably my language arts teachers and my um, social studies teachers. We do have quite a few science, both life science and earth science teachers, and, um, and some math teachers that are involved. I have one music teacher. Um, I have a civics teacher. I have a librarian. So you'll get a chance to see what these teachers have been able to do with this particular tool. Um, we have a particular training model that seems to have been successful. Um, when, when people, teachers come to be trained, they can't come to training if they don't bring a student with them. And so the, the, the beauty of that is that immediately when you start to take the teachers into the space, um, they become much more comfortable when they see that the student partner is real excited about being in that space, that they're very comfortable moving around, that they're not worried at all about remembering what the icons tell them to do and how to move forward or how to jump and fly. And so the, the teacher kind of drops their worry and begins to think about it as a tool. And, and that's how I try to phrase it with the students uh, and the teachers, um, that this is a tool for learning. And so it is a, an ability, a tool that you can use to differentiate instruction, that you'll be able to really meet your students' needs where they are. The, the conversation also becomes between the student and the teacher, how can we use this space? or who's going to have a harder time working in this space. Or, um, and they actually start then planning out lessons together. Immediately that teacher has um, a, a technology specialist sitting beside them. And many of the teachers go back and then train other students so that they, they have those experts in their classroom. And my teachers will tell you that the hardest thing for them is that shift away from being in charge and then trusting that the student's understanding of the medium um, is going to get them through it all. Many of my teachers are not comfortable in this space, and so they, they um, are hesitant about doing something that they don't think they really understand fully. And for that many, it's, it's that jump of faith, and it also shifts the relationship with their students. I think it, it also transcends um, other projects where it becomes a much more student-centered, student-focused kind of a world. Um, it is a constructivist. We're within Active Worlds is, the, is our chosen um, virtual world setting. And that's because I can have lots of layers of protection going on. I have archived chat that I can pull if necessary. I have a nanny bot that um, is on the lookout for um, conversations that we may not want to hear. Um, I also you know, can censor words from the students. Um, so I, I can have a higher level of control as to what can go on in that space just with the language. And, um, and as I mentioned, it's constructivist, not really immersive. It's all about the kids building. Um, along the way, please make sure you ask questions if, there, if you have questions, and, and I'll try to be attentive to that too. But for the most part, what I want to show you is how the kids are building in this space and what the teachers are doing um, with the projects that they have in there. Um, we're going to move through a series of some middle school projects. And in the next slide, you'll see this is a, a social studies teacher. This is a seventh grade um, social studies teacher who used a gallery space to create was, was kind of a museum for World War II. Ultimately, you'll be able to see that um, lots of the teachers like this museum kind of a focus. And it becomes a conversation that they have with their students too about how do you organize the information. The, the, in a museum setting, there's a reason for why things are down one aisle or one row um, and not another. And if I'm a, a museum display, there's a reason why my display might be positioned beside another display. So the students working in groups, probably two to four, depends upon the teacher, um, are asked to organize what they've learned, to synthesize their knowledge. They have a limited amount of space, so they have to problem solve how to put that information in that space. And then they, they build out kind of a, a walking museum piece. In the next slide, you'll see um, this particular teacher was one who really loved the medium himself. And so first he built Washington, D.C. in his space. He is a civics teacher, and he was talking about the federal government. And so he was building up the backdrop for
for the students. And in the, the following slide, you'll see that he's used the Supreme Court for the backdrop of a court case. Within his civics class, he was, he was teaching about um, levels of, of, of kind of the first-degree murder, second-degree murder. He had um, the students then as avatars um, argue the different positions. They talked about the, the rules of being a positive and negative kind of conversations within their court case setting. Um, he brought in another teacher who acted as, um, as the person who was the, the kind of the foreman of the jury and, and kept things moving along too. So he ran his court case entirely then in this particular setting. Um, when, when this particular teacher was sharing this faith with us, you know, he built out federal government. He still needs to do state government and local government. And he's going to turn over the world and let his kids do some building at that point. The next space is, a, is an algebra space. Um, this is a seventh grade teacher. And for the most part, one student is building out in this world. Um, and he's one of those just um, pretty amazing kids who is comfortable within the space, but then he also is really comfortable with the material. And so as new concepts are, are entered in or are added, um, this particular student and then two or three other friends within the class build out the space as kind of a tutorial space. You can think of him as perhaps doing the, the next generation Khan Academy here. Um, he, he shows himself um, in video answering problems and doing problems. He imports that video into this section. Um, and he, he also has some, some kind of questions and quizzes that he pops into the space too. So, um, so this particular student, for the teacher then, is building out a tutorial world. And it kind of keeps up with the concepts as they are um, hitting those concepts. He started his work actually for this teacher as a seventh grader, and now he's in eighth grade, but he continues working for her in this particular space. The next slide takes us to a geometry performance task. Um, this particular teacher is using the space. We have within Virginia Beach a real push for balanced assessment. And so, yes, we have the accountability of having um, you know, our standards-based tests. Our, we call them standards of learning, which are SOLs, which um, in a military town has another phrase to it, too. But um, the, this teacher, though, is also doing a performance task. So she has her groups working in teams of four. Um, they are given a challenge, in this particular one, meteorites landed in a cer certain spot of the United States, and they have to determine what kind of a quadrilateral shape was made from those meteorites and, and give evidence and to prove one quadrilateral shape over another. Um, part of the performance task, they have to import video. Um, they use Animoto as a piece of showing in, in the nature different examples of quadrilaterals, and they can then have that for reference. She often organizes it so that there might be one or two students in the team actually building in world, and then the others might be their researchers or the organizers. And what many of the teachers have found is they spend a lot of time out of world with the planning, with the organizing. I have one teacher who's created a building plan so that the kids can't actually start their building until they've, they've demonstrated
Yes, I know. Lord Hogan, thank or I should say Golden Greenie, thank you so much for recommending me to you. Thank you so much. And the good thing about it, it was right at directly after the session. Um, Susan and Mike took it to actually donate to the Catholic Soul. So if you guys want, um, lunch starting at 7 o'clock. Um, he's going to give you the information so you can go in there and you can see what he's been talking about. And I've been in there and, and it's a lot of fun. Okay, I'll be quiet now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Technology, love it, hate it. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, well, so the, the next slide that Gord can take us to lets you see um, how a, a seventh grade life science teacher is using this space. Um, this is a, a, a genetics project. And the, the teacher had, once again, the students working in teams and they were each assigned a particular topic within genetics. Um, what also comes into play is not just then the content, but um, they, they can link to other sections, they pull in other information, but there's, there's also kind of a, an affective piece to it too. Um, if you choose to come on the tour and go into the space, the, the booth that talks about um, breast cancer has, has kind of almost a reverent feel to it. And then you find out that the students involved had some personal experiences with that too. So, you know, it, it once again is all about self-expression in learning. And it's, it's great for kids then to have that chance to, to really um, have, a, have a way to, to present themselves. The next slide shows you a geologic timeline. This was an earth science teacher. Um, and so she had her students, you know, building out those pieces of that geologic timeline. And, and the, the slide following that was a, is another earth science teacher. This particular teacher was one of my first adoptees. Um, she actually used the space to review for an end of semester test, um, kind of the big end of semester exam. And in, as a middle school teacher, she has about 100 um, students. She actually took all of the main concepts that they needed to review. Each of the students had a particular two or three concepts they built within the world review information, and then she used it as an active place for review. One night I came in and I, I ran into kids who were all quizzing each other in this space, and at the same time they were watching um, President Obama's you know, State of the Union address. So they were actively engaged and, and having fun as they were reviewing for their end of semester Earth Science test. She's um, sharing her space. Um, if you look real closely on this slide, there's a, a math piece within her space. And she's <coughs> sharing it because, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, there's a teacher in, in her building who is, does not have their own world. And so um, they kind of came begging to this teacher and said, please, please, our kids are, we have the same kids. Can they be building in there too? This particular teacher is also doing a, a polarity study. Um, so she, you'll see to the top right, she has some signs set up. Um, she wants them to be debating um, a mining challenge. And so the idea of, of uh, uranium mining in Virginia is a big topic. And so as they walk down the path, they will be um, choosing whether they think for economic reasons we should mine, uh, they'll go in one direction, or they sh we shouldn't mine for natural, for uh, protecting the environment reasons. And then she's set up things for them to read. They'll be then coming up with their different opinions and then in the real world, they'll end up having a Socratic seminar based on that piece. Next slide, you'll see um, Oliver Twist. This particular teacher is using the space to look at five global perspectives that would have affected the times of, of the, the novel Oliver Twist. And so she's building out a section that talks about the political time, the social time, economic, geographic, and the religion piece. This teacher who's running this particular world is a gifted resource teacher. So she then is able to bring her world into other classroom settings so she can share her space with lots of others too. Let me just take a moment and see any questions to this point. Can 
I um, see kind of a, a wave or a, or a sign of, of um, some indication? Can you see how teachers that you might be working with or you yourself might, might be interested in using the space these days? Great. What I, what I love is the, um, the creative nature with it. And especially when you, when you also think about those 21st century skills, um, we, we definitely want to make sure this is letting those kids be creative and critical thinkers and problem solvers. And, and then the collaboration piece is also huge. The next slide shows you a world that, um, that I, is, is really touches my heart. Um, the, this is a section of a language arts teacher's world. And she's a seventh grade language arts teacher. Um, she was also an early adopter. She, she doesn't use it as much for all of her students. She offers it as a choice. And so um, the, what you see in front of you is a museum of Armenian genocide. And this particular student, once again, a seventh grade student, they were doing a, what they called a journey study. And they had to read an autobiography or a biography and understand the journey of that particular person who was showcased in the book. Um, this particular student is actually um, one of those gifted students that's kind of a perfectionist student. Um, and you may have taught them along the way. They're the kind of kid who would rather fail than do something that wasn't perfect in their mind's eye. And um, this student built out this museum as you go into her world, um, she actually has controls your experience so much that you click on spaces. She'll say, click here, and, and she'll move your avatar to just where she wants you to be. And then she'll tilt your head so that you see exactly what she wants you to see. And as you walk through, she's pulled kind of strategic quotes from um, the political time, too. And, and you move through, and it's the story of a young boy who is an Armenian Jew. And, and what his life was like during the time of Hitler. And as you kind of walk through, you can see there's a map and you can see his travels and his family's travels. Ultimately, much of his family um, is killed during the time. And, and you'll see the burning of the houses in that bottom piece of that slide. And then at the very end, as you click on the very last piece, she takes you to the cemetery where once a week he visits um, the graves. And what's What's really um, interesting, and I, I happened to come to this room one night when she was working with her human solicitor. She was working in this space, and her avatar looked physically tired. And, and I could say, you know, Salista, you know, are, are you okay? And this is amazing. And, and she finally found a medium that suited her needs. Um, since that time, she's been real comfortable using this space. She actually spoke to our school board when we were sharing these, these projects with them. And, and she's someone who doesn't talk very much. Um, she, she really is uncomfortable in the real world, but she's real comfortable in this space. Um, yeah, she, she's just an amazing child, and, and what a great opportunity for her to be able to express herself. She found voice in this space. The next slide takes you to another middle school project. My middle school teachers are really having a lot of fun in here. Um, this is another school. This is a music teacher. Um, and so he's using the space. Yay, there we are. He's using the space to, to introduce music genres. Um, and so he had his band um, students build out different sections. And, um, and you can kind of experience the music, and you can also then um, get an idea of, of uh, just an appreciation for the different music pieces. Um, he's taken a break from working in the world because they had to have some state trials, so he had to be practicing in the real world. But um, he's interested in creating um, some kind of an orchestra area and actually taping his students so that their music then is the music that you hear in the space. We're going to move to some high school um, the, um, images and some examples of high school worlds. And the next slide takes you to um, a high school English teacher. And this particular teacher had the students, um, her ninth, actually it was her 12th graders, um, build out at the first part of this year. It, it's actually a spot that, um, double check, there was a, oh, day two, okay, sorry. Um, there was a spot she actually created different, um, had the students create different houses that depict the 
levels of research, the steps to a research project. And so um, you can see kind of off to the left, there's one of the houses within Ms. Laurel talks about organizing information. And so her upper level students, as a review before they did their research project, um, put together some tips and all of the steps. They had to import some video. Um, there were certain other requirements that came along with this piece too. And now she has these separate um, houses within a section of the world that then talk about all of the levels and the steps of research. Her intent is that now it's about time for her ninth graders to do their research project. She's going to bring them into this space and this will be where they learn how to research. Um, she won't have to teach, and, and she honestly, honestly said um, she did this because she hates teaching research in the traditional way. It was kind of getting old <laughs> and getting, getting um, a little kind of boring for her. So she found this to be, a, um, personally, a more exciting and innovative way as a teacher to be building um, the space out to. So she now has kind of a research world component. Last year, the same teacher um, used the space for a poet study. And what she actually had the students then do was they built out homes that represented different American poets. And it was kind of fun to travel through to see, um, you know, Emily Dickinson's house was kind of dark and dreary and very linear, you know, very, um, and she was standing at the door in a white bride's um, outfit because she was, was wearing white for the bride that she would never be. Um, right next door was Walt Whitman and his walls were translucent and there was grass on the ground the, on the inside of his, on the floor. And um, it was kind of fun because then in addition to all of this, it became very metaphorical. And so she was actually having them depict the, the poets and the lives of the poets metaphorically through the homes that they were building. If you move to the next slide, um, oh, we're right there, right there. Don't, don't go any further. Um, <laughs> this is, um, this is one of my schools. It's actually our um, alternative high school. The teacher who's working in this space um, is actually, um, she has a 12th grade English class. Most of her students are working at about a third or fourth grade level. But she found that they're excited to use this space for some of their storytelling. Um, she's building out a modern day Canterbury. And at the, um, th there was a question, I'm sorry, the music and poetry project. Do the music and poetry projects? Um, yes, they do. You can incorporate the sound. Um, the, and actually, in the, in the piece that we're in right now, the, the bottom of this where you see the, the portraits, um, this is a modern day Canterbury. The teacher was having the students read the Canterbury Tales, but then they, they kind of moved it to the setting of New York City. And then through kind of um, a, a pathway, there are portraits of the, the different um, pilgrims that you might find as you are walking through New York City. And the students drew the images and they wrote the stories of the pilgrims. And they were actually doing this as part of a study of satire as well. Um, the, the actual piece then is that they, um, they audio, there's an audio component. The students will read then their descriptions of their pilgrims and as you walk through this space, you can click on the portrait and you hear the student with music in the background reading um, as if they are first person, that particular pilgrim. The teacher who is doing this, as I mentioned before, this is an alternative high school. These are students who are struggling, very, very, very much at risk students. Um, but part of what you also see is her attendance is higher when she's working in this space. And, and that's a big piece too, that um, you really need to make sure that um, you get the kids there. And so if this is the thing that will get them there, then that's, that's huge. This particular teacher is also teaching an online group of students. And so we created another world for her. And her worry was that her students weren't feeling like they were much part of a community in just a pure online environment. So they're, they're building within this space and they're meeting within this 3D space. If you move on to the next slide, um, I do have, at a high school level, a, a media center specialist who's involved. And um, what she's built here, let me just wait till it loads. There it is. Um, with the help of one of her um, students, she built out a model of her media center. And so this is actually you know, the Salem High School Media Center. What she used it for to begin with, in the fall, the
the new ninth graders to the school, um, she would have to find time for them to come down and actually, you know, tour the the library and get comfortable with things. She did that all through the virtual world this year. So she didn't physically have to do any tours and physically bring the students in. Um, she did all of that just within the space Avatar to Avatar. She's also running some book studies across the city. Um, other media center specialists are actually having their students read the same books and then they come and meet in her world for um, book talks within this particular space too. So it's, it's another opportunity to once again use it in a different way. Um, I love the, the creativity of the teachers that have come into the project. Um, once, they, once they stop worrying about the logistics of how to make it work, then they can start to think about it once again as a tool. And, and that's really kind of how I try to phrase it from the start. If you go into the next slide, um, I mentioned that we're piloting this actually with, with some elementary school students. And, um, and I have a lot of support from, from our computer science resource specialist at elementary level. Um, she's actually helping to, to hold the hands of the teachers doing this. We have three elementary schools in the pilot. The computer resource teachers there are helping the fourth grade teachers. And they're all around the topic of Jamestown. Um, the, the Jamestown folks are, um, well, Jamestown is a huge topic here. We're, we're right in Virginia. Our, I'm in Virginia Beach. And so Jamestown is important to us as local history, but certainly important as national history, too. And the, the idea is that each of the three schools, we worked with them to create a performance task. Um, one of the schools is interested in, in building out the story. Um, they've all read a book, a novel called Blood on the River. And it's about a cabin boy to Captain John Smith. And so one of the schools is going to have the students build out the world that you see um, and depict the events from that book. Another of the schools is going to focus on looking at what artifacts may have been left behind that would be um, kind of important to the Native Americans, to the Powhatan Indians. So they're going to create a Powhatan Indian uh, kind of an archaeological dig space. And then the third school is going to be looking at the artifacts that might have been there from the settlers. The, the students all have access to each other's world, so they'll be able to offer tours and bring each other into their space. Um, we purposely identified the names of the students in such a way that their school is identified too, just by their naming. And so they'll be able to see what school they might be working in. And, um, and the teachers are going to then be able to kind of use that space as a teaching tool too. We, we've just taken them in to do some of the tutorial work to get them comfortable building students were just amazing. Um, they were very comfortable working through the tasks. We had them partner and buddy. It, it really pushed them to be able to read and do um, very linear sequential thinking as you build within the space. And so we were excited by that first, that first step. Another part that's kind of fun about this project, that world that you see, um, it's kind of a Jamestown settlement. And on one side, you can see the Actually, the water kind of moves. You can't see that in the static image, but the water is lapping against the shore. Um, one of our middle school students built this space for them. Um, one of the computer clubs um, that kind of specialize in building within the worlds. And so we, we gave him a task and said, we're doing this project with elementary school kids. Could you please transform this world, the, one of the basic template worlds that we give them, can you transform this into Jamestown? And, and this is when he together. So we love the fact that a middle school student created the world that now the elementary school students are going to be fleshing out with their knowledge. To move to the next slide, I um, wanted to share with you, we, we just completed a school board presentation. And so with that in mind, we had, um, we had an opportunity to gather some information from some of the students. The upper left, where you see you know, how this Da Vinci worlds engage students learning, let me post a link for you so that for those of you it might be easier to actually just go to this particular Vimeo site on your own. So there's the link that we're going to be taking just a few moments to take a look at. Let me, let me preface this by saying um, these are students. They are elementary students, excuse me, middle school students, um, seventh grade students. These are the ones that were involved in the genetics project, that life science project. We also have a chance to hear from the principal of the school, who has been a real supporter of the project as well. And so for our purposes, I can also click here and showcase it here for those who can see it. But um, if you will also, if you want to kind of run
run it on your own. It's just about a three minute um, quick little synopsis. Okay, and I am playing the video. I liked uh, all the creativity you could use with DaVinci World. I liked how there were so many objects to work with and the cubicles. I liked that it was like a really different way to learn and how it was just really interactive with all your friends. And you could put like different signs, different colors, and it's not just like you're just doing a writing project. It's like you can talk to other people too. It was like kind of hard to figure out, but like, you could like, cause some people could figure it out easily, and then you could like click on their stuff and then know what to do too, and like they help you out. I noticed that the students were 100% engaged. Uh, the technology was easy for them to pick up on, but yet at the same time they didn't understand or recognize that what they were doing was in the learning about genetics, and it came as a natural learning process to them. We were able to go and like figure it out on our own because some kids were like they played with it before and they've learned about it like two kids in our class and they kind of helped us through the online chatting and it was really fun because we didn't really have to be told what to do by the teachers because I don't really like being told what to do and we got to like work with each other and figure it out on our own. I liked working with my friends and like letting your imagination run free. <laughs> I like the creativity and imagination you can use with it. Uh, what I liked about DaVinci World is that it was just a fun way to learn and you can also build and it's very interactive and enjoyable. Okay. You could go in with your friends and learn about different things, and uh, to me that was pretty awesome. So. Yeah, I like being able to chat with my friends because it's like you're more engaged in it. I liked how we could like have our own little space to like do whatever we wanted, to learn about something that we didn't like really know about, that we got to like learn in a cool way. I liked how it could let me do stuff that I thought I couldn't normally do with it unless it was like an elective or it was my choice and I thought it was hard at first but I really came to enjoy it. I think it's an incredible program. It hits the 21st century skills. It hits what students uh, enjoy in learning. You can learn, uh, you can build and stuff and use all your creativity and not just kind of sit at a desk and know things down. I like most about DaVinci World is that you had the freedom to do anything and that you could create anything that you wanted to. We should be hardwired, not going on wireless. We have access to computers, um, you know, kind of a computer carts, laptops. And what we've also found is that for the most part, you wouldn't necessarily need for a project to have everybody in the world all at the same time. The, the idea is that this is often a collaborative project. And so if the students are paired um, 
two working together, four working together, they, there may be one person who is actually building while the others might be researching and organizing information. Um, or they may be building other video or other medium. You know, often the performance tasks require that they bring in another piece of, of, uh, of technology. So, you know, I, it's, it's rare. We had those students, um, Mandy was helping as we were trying to bring the fourth graders in and teach them through the tutorial worlds, which I'll, I'll show you in just a moment. And so we had the students in there trying to work through um, learning how to build in that space. We actually paired them for that. So one student was reading through some of the directions. They had some task cards that they were working through. And then the other student had their hands on the computers and actually were building. And then they switched off with tasks. So it's, it's not about just you know everybody in the world building all at the same time. The, the best use of this material and this medium, it is to, as a way for them to organize and synthesize their knowledge and to display their knowledge and then to share it with others. So that's what we've actually been able to do with that. Um, the, the user IDs, um, we've actually built kind of a, um, a database system. And so part of the training is that I can teach the teachers how to um, enter in student information and then the IDs <coughs> are, are kind of um, generated automatically. We traditionally have the username and the password um, and then the citizen ID is kind of spit out. And once you register, it's immediate access into the world. Um, I also then will teach the teachers how to enter in those citizen IDs, how they can choose to have the students um, enter only, that they can you know, kind of control who's building and who's not building. And also it can control um, who has chat within that space too. And for the Jamestown, project, I ended up entering all of those citizen IDs because we had a particular naming convention that we wanted to have in place and, and my system wasn't going to generate that for us. Um, if you move on to the next slide, I can let you see um, exactly what kind of a tutorial world has been created. Um, the question has been asked if the students have the ability to speak in world. Um, we have not allowed that within the Da Vinci World project. Um, it, the capability is there. We've kept them to text. Um, part of that is because I have control over what is said then, so I have archived, um, I have access to all of the log chats. And, um, and then also, um, that's just my, that's my middle school teacher coming out in me that I need to feel like I have some, some control. Um, the, the students that are in the second project, the Real World In-World Engineering Design Challenge, do have access to the in-world capabilities for voice. Um, and you'll, you'll see that project in just a moment. What you see in front of you is a tutorial world. A lot of what we're doing has been guided by um, Margaret Corbett. Margaret Corbett was at the Supercomputing Center up at Cornell University. Um, she ran for years CUNY, Cornell University, and um, she, her work, she now has probably 10 to 15 years worth of experience with middle school and high school students and teachers. Um, she's our educational consultant for the work that we've been doing. And so one of the things that she helped to build out is that tutorial world. Um, and the, um, the question is asked, you know, are the skills transferable to any virtual world? Um, I, I am pretty much a novice at that piece. Um, you know, Mandy is much more adept at coming in and out of different worlds, so she might be able to answer that one better than I can. I do know that when I, for the first time, walked into Second Life last last week for practice for this session, you know, it was intuitive to me to move around in some of those, those pieces. I have not built within Second Life, so I don't know if my abilities to build in active worlds are similar to building here in Second Life. So, um, Mandy, I'm going to kick that question to you. Do you find that the skills that we use within active worlds are transferable into other virtual world settings? Amy notes that they should be. We'll let Mandy come up with that answer for us in just a moment. Um, but what you see with these tutorial worlds, um, there are 10 basic tasks. We kind of call them um, almost like our boot camp. And we actually have created task cards um, there are, the tasks are written around the walls of the tutorial world. Um, then I also have them for my elementary students. I actually printed the task cards out and I created um, some worksheets and modified them so that they would be able 
to, um, to, to kind of actually kind of work through it and record and write down certain pieces of that information. These have been just very helpful. They, they help the students independently work through those building skills. Um, they're very basic. You know, the idea of replicating an image and changing one model to another model and, and how they can change color and text and import sound. Um, the, the objects are predefined. Um, they can be modified and changed. Um, it shows them how to bring in and link to, um, to pictures. And it shows them how to ultimately, you know, once again, bring in that audio piece and link to websites. So the tutorials are used by teachers in different ways. I have some teachers who require that their students work through all 10 tasks, and it's kind of like their, their check off, that they're going to be uh, completed and they know what they need to know. Um, for the most part, my high school teachers kind of take their students into this space, give them a quick spin around and say, look, this is what you can do. And then they start a project and it's almost that need to know. Oh, you want to change the color of the sign? Go back and figure out how to do that. Or, oh, you wanted to link to a website? Go back and take, that, take a look at that text. So it's, it's, um, it's that kind of that tutorial space, that background space. It allows a, a novice to come in and pretty quickly learn some building skills. There's also higher level building worlds that you can go to, and so the students have access to that. And then we also try to let them see where they can go um, into some of the Active World archives and find other models too. Um, the next, let me take you to a, a little quick look at the, the second project that's going on in this space. Now, we're leaving Da Vinci Worlds for just a moment. Um, and just as kind of a baseline, Da Vinci Worlds is funded through my school system. We're, we're thinking about how to change the way it's been funded. Up until now, um, our central office, Curriculum and Instruction, has, has funded the project and then allowed me to offer a certain number of worlds to the teachers who are involved in our technology vanguard strands. We're starting to hear from other schools that they want to be involved. And so we're, we're talking about how might we share the cost with some of the schools, um, keep it certainly uh, very affordable, but then ultimately have an opportunity for the, the student or the teachers that who want to be involved to be involved, not just the technology vanguard schools. And then to take the biggest hunk of the cost away from central office and spread it out across the school system. So, so those are still discussions, but we're hoping to grow it and build, build it much, much um, kind of scale it up. The national challenge that you see in front of you is funded um, on a two-year grant, so participation within this is free. Um, it is a, a national challenge. The intent is to really highlight the engineering design process, and we have it uh, is open to middle school and high school students. It's called the Real World In World Engineering Design Challenge. Um, the real world part is where the students in face-to-face -face settings or in online communities work through the design process. They're solving one of two NASA-inspired challenges. Um, one challenge focuses around the James Webb Space Telescope. The second one focuses around Robonaut 2. That's who you see on the screen there. He's a humanoid robot on the International Space Station. And if you move to the next slide, you'll be able to see that there is a, a public space that's been built out for this. Um, it, this is a project that's kind of jointly a uh, USA Today education project. Where I am at NIA is managing the project. NASA is very involved. Their engineers and scientists come into the space to interact with the students. And um, throughout the very first part, even the real world piece, we had Q&A sessions in world so that the students could interact with the engineers who are involved in both of these projects. If you click to the next slide, we, um, we Vimeoed those interactions so that they would be archived and available. Um, we've moved now to the in-world phase of the challenge. That's the part that is totally in the virtual world setting. We have um, 20 teams in-world. Each of those is led by a college engineering student. The real-world teams, at the completion of their work, they had online design journals. They had images of their prototypes for their solutions. All of that was posted onto a website that, for lack of a better phrase, I call my eHarmony site. And, and in essence, it's a way for the real world teams to show what they are. The college students look at that work and tag up with the team that they want to bring in world. And so, if you go to the next slide, you'll get a peek at a team's world. 
I can't show you much about what's going on right now because they're very competitive. Uh, we just finished a week where the worlds were closed and we had evaluation teams going through and offering formative assessment. There was at least one NASA engineer on each team. And so they were able to see if the designs made sense based on real science and real math. And they offered suggestions if they weren't. You know, one, one group had a, a really cool foot for Robonaut 2 that would had an electromagnet that would create a magnetic field so it would stick to the side of the International Space Station. The problem being, and I didn't know this until one of our NASA engineers pointed out, that the International Space Station is aluminum. So that wouldn't really quite work, but it was a great idea. Now they have time to go back and um, modify and change some things too. So the teams, the college engineering students are anywhere across the country. We have a, a group from Ohio State, we have some in Florida, we have some at Rice University, at the University of Virginia. Um, so they meet their teams in world. They have their own team world space. They have two evaluated tasks that are going to be um, deciding the winners of this challenge. One is taking their thinking from the real world piece and bringing it into the virtual world. If you look at the next slide, you'll be able to see that they have um, taken the design challenge and they have been able to showcase their ideas and their thoughts as you walk through their knowledge spaces. And advocates, if you go to the next slide, part of what they also have to do is bring in and create 3D models within this space. We have access to um, PTC Creo, which used to be Pro Engineer and SolidWorks. These are both um, industry level modeling softwares. So the kids are getting a chance to use the kind of tools that they would really be using as engineers too. And Advocates is working to get me that slide. The, it's been great to see what they've been able to pull off. Uh, they, they've been working collaboratively. Their college engineering team leader is able to help guide the thought and refine the thought. They've just finished them with the first piece where they brought their real world design in world. And what they found um, is feedback. They'll be able to make improvements. They also, when they came in world back on Thursday, they found a mystery problem. And so they have a new challenge that they'll be working through. Ultimately, all of this work will be due the first week of April. The worlds will freeze again. They'll be kicked out. The evaluation team will have an opportunity to work through and see um, all of their designs. They'll be narrowed down to the top three James Webb telescope teams and the top three Robonaut 2 teams. Um, actually, I I'm have a, a lower level than the, U the U3000 server. The question asks if I'm using the U3000. I think I'm at the um, U2000, or it's the second level one, um, Golden. I, I don't have, I, I have the second level universe. I don't have the biggest one yet. So, um, they're, the models that they're building, all of the work that they're doing, we have a tech squad that helps with that. The college engineering students help bring those pieces in. Um, ultimately, those top three teams for each of the challenges will have about a week and a half to totally refine their work if they want to. There will be an open house where anybody can come and tour their spaces. And then the very final evaluation piece, they'll be scheduled for a 30-minute synchronous interview with the evaluation team and then they'll have to defend their design. They'll have to take their um, the evaluation team on a tour of their space, and then ultimately um, they'll have to answer the questions that might come from that. If you move to the next slide, um, you'll see this is the winning team from last year. This is the second year for the Real World In World Design Challenge. The end of my funding, right now um, we are working to find missions that are interested in continuing the work the James Webb Space Telescope people have committed to try to help fund their challenge. They'd like it to continue to run, but I need to find a second challenge to run as well to be able to keep it affordable. Um, and what you see, the, the picture off to the right, those are the, the winning team. Last year's team, it was a student from the University of South Florida, and it was um, three students from Lutheran Southern Academy. It's a school in Houston. 
one of the success stories, you'll see um, Jill pictured there, her avatar to the left and the real Jill to the, to the right. Um, Jill is now a freshman at Texas A&M. She's a mechanical engineering freshman. And Jill valued the experience so much that she is now one of my college team leaders. So I love, I love the fact that, oops, I'm sorry. Did you lose my, sound okay? Please let me know if you can hear me. Oh, great, thank you. Um, so, so I think it's a, it's, a, it's a real success story that one of my students from the winning team as a student last year is now a college um, a mentor. She's, she's one of the team leaders. I'd like to share with you um, the video short once again. Let me pull it up and put it in. We interviewed the winning team in World. And it, it's probably going to work best for everybody to go on their own to the link. But um, if you'll just take a moment, it, it's not all about what I can tell you. It's really what they can tell you. And so you'll get a chance to hear from Matthew and Jill and Adriana. Adriana got dragged into the project. You'll be able to hear that in her voice, too. Um, pretty much, I think Adriana does whatever Jill tells her to do. But, um, but it, it was just really um, wonderful to see how this experience came together for these students. Uh, link is broken. I can do. Let me just double check and make sure that I copied it correctly. Um, hold tight. Let me let me just go out and see what I can do to make that work. In the meantime, let's take questions. Actually, the, the link can be found on the Real World in World website, so, um, so I can at least guide you to that piece, too. Um, you go to... If you go here, this is the link that takes you to the NASA Real World in World website. And... Um, and we're, we're kind of past the point of actually being able to be an active participant, but all of the resources at that website are open and available. And if you have, if you work with students interested in engineering, or if you work with teachers that are interested in design challenges, all of the resources, um, interviews with the, the NASA researchers, interviews with the Robonaut 2 engineers, with the Jim Webb Space Telescope folks, there are videos on that site, there are, you can kind of work through how you would actually help students design a zero gravity foot for Robonaut 2. All of it's there. If you go to that link underneath uh, the last year's challenge or the winners, you'll be able to see this particular link too. I don't want to miss out on the opportunity to chat with you here in trying to look for that. So um, if you move to the next slide for me, please, Abacus. Just wanted to take a moment to stop and see what questions there might be. And then ultimately, if you're interested um, I can bring you in as tourists into the universe and let you wander around a bit, but I can also guide you to some of the, the same things that I had screenshots that I captured for you. Any questions so before we might consider going on a tour? Yes. As a tourist, my, my universe master checked it out on, a, on several of the worlds to be sure that you had capabilities. For the most part, you can come in as a tourist, um, not have chat capabilities, but we've opened that up so that you can chat in the worlds where I'll be taking you. And, um, and I actually have Margaret Corbett, my educational specialist that I mentioned, is going to be in world, um, over in active worlds in our, in our universe, there to help answer questions and guide you to it. Ah, Diane's already there too, great. And Mandy can...